It is my pleasure to introduce to you our two presenters for our session. Carrie and Luciano are both with our Marine Turtle Research Program here at the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. Carrie and Luciano, thank you both for joining us today. We're excited to learn all about Florida's sea turtles. Great. Well, I'm so glad that you guys are able to join us and share my love of sea turtles with you. So here we have a taxidermy coxbill sea turtle. You can see that it has this beautiful shell on top, which is called a carapace. The carapace is a hard shell that helps protect the animal from predators and harmful things such as boat props. The shell is made of all these little scoots. I'm not sure if you can see how they're divided. Um, and it grows with the turtle over its lifetime. So the shell stays with the animal throughout from life uh, until it, when it passes. But these scoots are made of keratin, which is the same thing that your fingernails are made of. So they'll grow with the animal and they'll break off and, and um, chip, but they grow back. The bottom of the shell is called the plastron, and it also has those scoots. There's four flippers. I like to say the front flippers are more like crescent shape. But sea turtles are reptiles, and they're cold-blooded. So that means that they have the scaled skin, that they have lungs for respiration, which lie just right underneath this carapace. They also have this beak here that is used to help um, grab their food, their prey, and also digest it and hold on to it. So when predators such as sharks come, they can use this mouth in this carapace to help protect them. So sea turtles, unlike tortoises, they can't hide in their shell to protect them. So they have to use their strong, powerful jaws and this hard carapace to fend off predators. So if you ever see a shark approaching a sea turtle, you might see it turning its back like this. So the whole idea is that they want the shark to try to bite this hard part because when you have the flippers here, this exposes more soft tissue and can cause more injury. So I have a question for you guys. How many sea turtle species do you think we have in Florida? Take this quick poll and then we'll go over it. Oh, it's a tough question, huh? Well, we have five sea turtle species. I'm going to go over them briefly with you. So bear with me while I get this loggerhead sea turtle. All sea turtles are endangered or threatened. Do you know what that means? That means they are protected by federal and state laws because if we don't protect them, then they may not be around in the future. So you can see this huge carapace that I'm bringing up. Uh, there we go. And it's a good thing I worked out today. So you can see how large it is. This is the size of an adult female loggerhead sea turtle. You can see the color is the rusty brown, and it's more of a coffin shape where it's wider at the insertion of the front flippers at top, and then down here is where the tail and the rear flippers would be. You can hear how hard it is. Can you hear that? It's that very bony structure to help protect them. So can you imagine the weight that's in the water? But can you imagine pulling your body up on the sand to nest when you weigh a couple of pounds? And that's just the carapace. So here's the loggerhead head known for the size of their head. They had this ginormous head here, right? <clears throat> and they have these very strong, powerful jaws that we talked about. Now, these strong, powerful jaws are used to crush animals, such as crabs and crustaceans, which is the loggerhead's favorite food item. Loggerheads are considered threatened in Florida. So next up, we're going to talk about is the leatherback sea turtle. This leatherback also is one of the largest of all sea turtles. It can weigh up to over a thousand pounds and get up to five, over six feet long. But what's unique about it is can you see these cusps up front that look like fangs? Do you see that? That's what helps them hold on to their favorite food item. Do you know what they like to eat? This large animal eats primarily jellyfish, right? So they're the deepest of divers, but this animal can survive on just jellyfish, and they use these fangs to help tear apart the jelly. I don't have any carapaces of it because the leatherback, unlike the other sea turtle species, don't have a hard shell. Their shell is a little bit more flexible and leathery, which is where they get their name from. And you can see that they have the five lateral ridges going down the top. Since their shell is so oily, it's hard to preserve it and show it here. Our next species is the green sea turtle. What's unique about a green sea turtle is that they have this serrated lower jaw. Can you see that? Sea turtles don't have teeth. They have this serration here, and it helps them tear up seagrass, which is what they like to eat. So it's like if you had a salad at home or a steak, you'd want to cut it up so you could have small pieces. 
That's exactly what these sea turtles do when they eat seagrass. They can put it here in the tomium and it helps break it up into smaller pieces. Green sea turtles also have this beautiful starburst pattern shell. Here's a carapace to it. You can see that by counting the number of scutes here, we can determine what species it is. So with green turtles, they have four lateral scutes, but they have that beautiful starburst pattern. The next species we're going to talk about, which is an endangered species, is the hawksbill sea turtle. They get their name from their hawk-like beak. You can see right here. And hawksbills, they like to eat sponges and sea urchins. So they help keep our coral reefs healthy. Hawksbills can get about two to three feet long and weigh up to 150 pounds. But they also have that beautiful starburst pattern shell, just like the green turtle, which you can see here. You can see that one of the unique things, though, is that their scutes that we talked about, that's made from keratin, they're overlapping. So they're almost like roof shingles, right? Um, so they're piled on top of one another. And that's how you can tell one of the unique characteristics of a hawksbill. But one of the reasons a hawksbill is critically endangered is because of their beautiful shell. It actually works against them. So they have, here's a scoop of a hawksbill. Have you ever heard of tortoiseshell jewelry? In fact, my glasses are fake tortoiseshell. So it has that beautiful starburst pattern, and people hunt these sea turtles for this scoop. And they can make bracelets, and they can make pins, sorry, and rings using the sea turtle shell. And the last species we're going to talk about is the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, which is right here. You can see that this beak is a little bit different than some of the other beaks when I compare them. Like when you look at the green turtle, you can see how blunt it is here. Then you can look at the hawksbill and you can see how pointed it is. Sorry, not hawksbill, Kemp's Ridley. The Kemp's Ridley has these very pointed beaks and they like to eat crabs and shrimp as well. And they, it's one of their favorite food items. But let me show you this. Look at this carapace. What do you notice about it? You notice how wide it is, right? It's very discus shaped. They also have the five lateral scutes, but the discus shape, how wide it is, is one of the neat characteristics of a Kemp's Ridley because they're generally going to be wider than they are in length. So, now that I know you've been paying attention, can you tell me what a sea turtle's favorite food item is? Crabs, jellyfish, seagrass, sponges, or is it all of the above? Well, some of you got it right, but it's all of the above because species eats something a little bit different than the other. All right. So uh, now that you know what species come and nest here in Florida, uh, let's talk about uh, the nesting process, actually. Um, I always like to point out that Florida is one of the most important places for sea turtles in the world, especially the loggerhead turtles. We host, with Florida, we host the largest nesting populations of loggerhead floor, uh, turtles, which is amazing. So we have a very, very important job on conserving these species. Okay? We also have a very good number of green turtles nesting and a little bit slow, uh, lower number of the leatherbacks. Very few hawksbill and camps really come to nest in our beaches. But I want to talk about the nest itself. Okay? Um, before I, I talk about this, and I actually kind of give away a little, uh, how many eggs do you think a sea turtle lay in a given nest? And how many times during a nesting season that for us here it's between uh, late February to October? How many nests do you think one female turtle lay during the nesting season? All right, I, I'd say that, you know, people are going either one, but a lot of eggs inside, or four to five. Actually, each, it depends a little bit on the species, but overall, we can say that each female turtle during a nesting season will lay between four and five nests, and each of those clutches of eggs or nests will have 110 eggs. So if you think about this, actually each female will, at the end of a nesting season, have laid about 500 eggs. 
And that seems a lot, right? Well, we got to remember the two things. Not all of the eggs will become baby turtles or hatchlings. And because hatchlings are so tiny, okay, you, you can see a hatchling here. This is a, a leatherback hatchling. You can see that the hatchlings are very, very small. So they are very easy prey to a lot of predators. So, for example, raccoons, coyotes, uh, pigs, ghost crabs. A lot of animals can actually eat the hatchlings when they are on the beach. And once they go in the water, there's a lot other uh, groups of animals that can eat them. So when we are on nesting beach, you see that the eggs are actually buried this deep, right? And all of these little eggs inside, they are different than a, a, a chicken egg, for example. They're pretty much the size of a ping pong ball, okay? But the shells are soft because the turtles laid so deep that if all the eggshells were hard, as these eggs fell into the nest, they would break. So because they are soft, they can actually absorb that impact and be okay. So after about 45 days to 50 days, these little hatchings are going to start coming out of the, the eggshells, and they're going to go up the sand, which takes them about three to four days, and then they actually will get out of the sand and reach the surface. Now, that's a very important moment. They usually do that at night, mostly because it's colder. It's kind of what triggers them. Eventually, in a very cold morning um, or very rainy days, you can see hatchings coming out during the day, but usually it's at night. And it's an interesting thing because as they came out at night and reached the surface, now they had to find the ocean, right? And how do they do that? They go to the brightest place. And on a dark beach, the darkest place is always the ocean. Despite of a, a, a full moon night or not, they're always going to be able to find the ocean because it's going to be the brightest place. Remember that in the back of the beach, you're going to have dunes, sometimes vegetation. But then comes a problem. If you have a lot of lights from buildings, a restaurant, or street lights, or even city glow, these hatchings can get disoriented and not find the ocean so easily, which if they're spending more time on the beach, more predators can find them. So there's a very, very simple thing that you guys can do to help the turtles, the baby turtles, or even the adults that get scared of the light as well. If you're by a, a, a nesting beach, make sure that you help the beach becomes dark. So close your drapes, turn off the light, use turtle-friendly light. Another thing, and I know a lot of you love to go to the beaches around here and play and making holes and make castles. These little hatchings can eventually fall into these holes or get trapped on the castles. So make sure that when you leave the beach, you leave no trace on the beach. Don't leave trash. Make sure you take your umbrellas, your uh, beach furniture, and, and take it all back home. Make sure that you cover the holes and put down the tin castles so that the baby turtles can go and be safe. All right? So now we're going to transition back to the water because the baby turtles are in the water. They went through the beach. And they're good. They're good to go. And I'm going to head back to Carrie to talk a little bit more about the dangers that the baby turtles face in the water. Hi, Carrie. Carrie, you appear to be on. Wait. Okay, how's that? Okay, sorry, guys. So, I'm <laughs> so Luciana was talking about these hatchlings and how, how many predators they have on, on the beach, such as they have ants um, that can predate the hatchling, birds, crabs, coyotes, um, feral hogs can all get into the nest or even depredate on a little hatchling. So once these hatchlings go out into the ocean, it's kind of like as a little fish in the sea, technically, right? So they have a whole different set of obstacles and predators to deal with once they're in the ocean. 
Now remember, sea turtles spend majority of their life at sea. The only time they come ashore is when they're sick, injured, or dead, or if they're coming up to nest, which is only the females. So these little hatchlings are swimming out to the sargasm. They float around there for the first 10 or 15 years of their life. But not only do they have to worry about birds and big fish out there, they also have to worry about sharks, but also some man-made obstacles, right? Humans, unfortunately, um, encroach on habitat that can interact with these sea turtles. So sometimes the sea turtle can be entangled in the monofilament fishing line that is floating freely throughout in the ocean, right? So that's one of the reasons that it's really important if you um, cut your fishing line that you bring it back to shore with you and you recycle it. If a sea turtle gets caught on this on this flipper, remember sea turtles don't have fingers and hands like we do. They have flippers. So it's going to be very difficult for them to get it off. And sometimes if this fishing line wraps really, really tight around the flipper, the flipper can actually can do a lot of damage to it and the sea turtle may lose its flipper. Another obstacle with fishing that they may encounter is commercial fishing line or hooks or recreational fishing. I don't know if you can see that. This is a commercial fishing hook that was found in one of our sea turtles that stranded. And what we do is we try to figure out what type of fishery it's from and then we also take the animal in and get it rehab and get it to be released. Another obstacle that sea turtles may encounter when they're out in the open ocean is nets, right? Commercial nets, fishing nets, regular cast nets. So sea turtles can sometimes accidentally get caught in these nets, not knowing, and they may accidentally drown because sea turtles can only hold their breaths for so long, right? So it's just kind of like you. When you're really scared or nervous, you pants heavily, you get your breath gets short, right? Same thing with sea turtles. If they're in a situation that they're not comfortable with, if they're entangled in something or stuck on something, their breath's going to pick up. So eventually, um, if they can free themselves, or they may end up drowning that way. But when sea turtles wash in, or when a sea turtle gets sick or injured, this is where my job comes in. So I'm a sea turtle stranding coordinator. So I work with all the dead and injured and sick sea turtles, where Luciano, he spends primarily all his time with the nesting females. So when a sea turtle comes in, it will be washed in on the beach. The currents will bring the sick animal in, or the injured animal. Or we may have boaters that are out there that find an animal in which our FWC law enforcement or some of our permitted volunteers may respond to. When the animal washes in, unfortunately, sometimes the animal is really, really sick. But we're kind of giving it a second chance at life. Each sea turtle gets one of these forms that we fill out. So there's a lot of paperwork that's involved. And what we do is we write the location of where the turtle's found, any type of injuries, anomalies. We take measurements. And then we want to know basic questions. Does the animal have any hook and line injuries, boat-related injuries, any diseases, leeches, anything you could think of? So, you know, sometimes, like here's an example of a loggerhead sea turtle, oops, this way, that got caught on a long line hook. And even though it looks really simple, right, the hook is just hanging out of the mouth, you think that, oh, maybe I can just remove that. But it's not simple, as you know, that um, abscesses will form or you can get um, bacteria that gets in there and it needs to get into the vet to um, give it some medicine and heal it up before it can be released. So when we talk about measuring a sea turtle, here's a little green carapace. I'm going to just show you really quickly how we measure a sea turtle to get an actual measurement on it. So we take these curved tape measures that we have here, and I don't hold my turtles up when I measure it, but I go right here from the nuchal notch, if you can see that, all the way down to the end of the pygle, so it goes all the way across the carapace and I write that measurement down. So this is 36.5 centimeters. Same thing for the width. When I measure the width of a sea turtle, I don't know if you can see me doing this, I'm taking it and moving it up and down, and I find the widest point. And again, usually I'm standing over the turtle documenting this. I'm not holding it up. And then I record the measurement as 31 centimeters. And then that's what we write down right here when we take our measurements for the animal, whether it's curved or straight measurements. But another thing that might make a sea turtle sick, right, is what, who eats the jellyfish? You said the leatherback, right? Leatherbacks love jellyfish. But when you see this plastic bag floating in the ocean and you see this jellyfish next to it, sea turtles can't decipher the difference, right? So they may not know and they may end up ingesting this plastic, in which that would not make a sea turtle feel good. So when they do wash in and they go to one of our rehab centers, they do the same thing that your doctor does when you go to the pediatrician when you're not feeling well. The only difference is, is that sea turtles can't talk, right? So the sea turtle veterinarians got to figure out by clues what's going on with the turtle. So they mainly do the blood work, they take x-rays, they um, 
look for anything unusual. They'll look over the turtle and say, oh, look, there's a cut here on the plastron, or there's some injury to the flipper. From then, from there, they decide what type of medicine the animal may need. And then the animal's in rehab anywhere from a couple weeks, a couple months, to a couple years, just depending on the injuries. And then the goal is to eventually release it back out in the wild to where the animal's stranded at. When we do that, we always put a tag on the animal. This tag is unique to this individual. So you can see here, it's usually a unique lettering and numbering system, usually three letters and three numbers, or one letter and four numbers. And it goes, it's inserted on the front flippers here. Sorry, right there. So when the animal's released, it has this tag. We also put an internal pit tag in, which I'm not sure, sorry, I'm a little off with my camera here. You can see that pit tag, it's about the size of a grain of rice. That is the same thing that they put in your dogs and cats in their shoulder blades so that if they wander away from home, they could find their way back home. So we put these in sea turtles, we bid them farewell, we say good luck, and we release them. But that way, if that animal comes up on the beach to nest again, or if she's found with a research project, or unfortunately if she gets, he or she gets sick again, then we know the history on that animal. We can look at their tag number and find anything that we need to know on that animal and why it originally stranded. So sea turtles, um, are amazing animals. They don't always need to go to rehab. They have these amazing healing abilities and they do very well out in the open ocean. So what's my one question for you before we conclude today? Well, I actually have two, sorry. But my um, question now is, what might the sea turtle mistake as food? Do we want, is it plastic bags, seabirds, or a large cheese pizza? I think I already gave you the answer, or at least I showed it to you. Excellent, guys. Right. That didn't take long. Plastic bags. So I think we'll probably be having a cheese pizza for dinner tonight. So I want to know what you can do at home to help sea turtles survive. I know some of you may be along the coast or, or along the ocean, but some of you are not. But everyone can still help sea turtles survive. What do you think you can do? Anyone have any ideas on clicking on this? It's a lot to read. Okay, well, we're, I will tell you, we're going to do all of those, right? Because all of those can help sea turtles. So if you close the shades on the windows and keep the light off during nesting season, that will help sea turtles from being disoriented and headed inward versus towards the water, which is where we want them to go. We can cover holes after playing on the beach because sometimes these little hatchlings, when they're crawling down to the water, they get stuck in these holes and they can't dig out because they're too small. Same thing with the nesting females. Some of these holes that you guys dig are pretty, pretty big. So just remember to cover them back up when you're done. Mind your trash, right? We don't want to make the environment any dirtier than it already is. So always, when you go to the beach or you go out on the boat or you're having a day on the water, enjoy yourself, but take everything home with you. Don't leave your beach furniture on the beach. There's numerous calls that we receive about sea turtles getting stuck underneath lawn chairs or, or getting stuck underneath um, pieces of rope or, or stuck, entangled in rope that's on the beach or underneath beach umbrellas, whatever the situation. So remember to take your beach furniture off. These are things you may not always think about, but they do have a, a significant impact on sea turtles. Recycle those fishing lines and hooks. I don't need to say anything else, but just a picture. You know that turtles can get entangled in that pretty easily. And boat carefully. Always keep your eyes on the water, because you never know who's going to come up and take a breath in front of your boat. So just remember, all these things can help sea turtles in the long run survive. So I know sea turtles rock, but I need you to help me say that. So on the count of three, let's all yell, sea turtles rock. Ready? One, two, three. Sea turtles rock! Sea turtles all right, rock. guys. I heard that. Thank you, Luciano. Well, thank you so much for inviting us to share sea turtles with you. Does anyone have any questions that we haven't answered? I think you're muted now. Jessica, sorry. I've done it every time this morning. So yes, thank you both for that. That was amazing info. And we actually have received several questions while you guys have been talking. So let me take a look through here. Uh, our first question is, how do you know how old they are? Well, that's a great question. I'll take that, Luciano, if you don't mind. You can't age a sea turtle. We can just uh, guesstimate an, an age based on their size. So sea turtles, if, we, if they're in rehab, they're going to grow a lot faster, um, so that doesn't give us a true representation. But we know that they need to be at least 20 years old to be able to reproduce, so 
a female that is on the beach nesting is at least 20 years old. So there's no way they really age a sea turtle or even sex a sea turtle if it's a male or female externally until they're adults. Our next question, Olivia B would like to know, why do sea turtles nest so far away from the water? That is a great question. So one important thing is um, that sea turtles, they have to, to have a, a nice place for their embryos and their eggs to develop, right? If they lay too close to the water line and there's a big high tide or a big storm, those nests eventually get eroded. For example, a couple of weeks ago, we had a very big storm coming and that wasn't even that close to Florida, but just the amount of waves and how strong they were, we had eggs spread over pretty much all the east coast of Florida last about two, three weeks ago. And that's okay. Remember how I said that each turtle usually nests four to five uh, nests in a, in a given season? So they spread her nests out in various places of the beach. Usually they try to go as farther away from the water as they can. Some species do nest a little closer or in the middle of the beach, like loggerheads, for example. Other species like to nest closer to the vegetation, like green turtles or hawksbills, for example. Okay? So that's the main reason that they're trying to get away from those waves that eventually can erode that nest away and lose those, those eggs. All right. Um, our next question, this was actually asked a couple of times. They want to know where you got all the shells. So these are actual specimens that have washed up on the beach dead. Um, and when we're out there documenting them, when we're out there filling out this long form, sometimes we salvage these turtles to do a necropsy on them. So the necropsy is the same as an autopsy on a human, but a necropsy. So we'll salvage these turtles to try to determine a cause of death. When we're doing that and going through their gut content, which I actually didn't show you, um, but here's a picture of one of our rehab facilities. They found. They found this in the gut content, the stomach of a sea turtle. And you can see, unfortunately, there's a lot of plastic pieces or man-made items, such as soles of shoes, pens, wrappers, and stuff. So that's how we um, gather all that information. And when we have those animals in for necropsy, that's when we conserve and um, use the shell in the skull for educational outreach. So sometimes we also get uh, turtles that have been shown as display, and this is was brought to me by law enforcement about six months ago. And somebody had their turtles just displaying in a restaurant, which is not allowed by law. Sea turtles are endangered, and nobody can mess with them. You've got to leave them alone. So it's prohibited to hold or have any, any sea turtle pieces. This one specifically, you can see that there's a big hole there. Somebody actually harpooned this turtle and killed it on purpose. Unfortunately, that still happens. Okay, so that's illegal. You can actually be in big, big trouble if you have those. So in this case, the law enforcement brought it back to us, and we can have it as an educational tool. Thank you. Okay, we're going to do one final question. What would eat a large loggerhead? Is there a big anything? shark? Yeah. So shark. Tiger shark. Bull shark. Go ahead. Sorry. So we actually have a picture. Our right whale uh, group was out doing a right whale survey, and they saw a great white offshore. Um, and we have a pictures of it, like head to head with a loggerhead sea turtle. And you'll notice um, when the pictures that they took, every time the shark came close, like I told you earlier, the sea turtle had its shell turned towards the shark, so that if the shark were to attack, the sea turtle's hoping it would attack its shell. So all the pictures, the turtle's on its side. Every once in a while, we'll get a call, too, about sea turtles flipped upside down offshore. Um, and the boaters like, man, the sea turtle's swimming erratically, it's swimming upside down. And there's been research that a sea turtle, there must be a large animal underneath it, which what is larger than a sea turtle that can harm it would be a large shark, is protecting himself. And that's why he flips upside down. And then eventually the turtle rights itself and, and swims on, and they don't see it again. Um, so very big, large sharks can eat sea turtles. In, 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 in Costa Rica, in some areas of Central America, another part of big adult females, and that's when they're nesting on the beach, are jaguars. And I've seen it happen twice, which is amazing. Well, the scene is amazing, of course, not for the sea turtle. 
but uh, a, a jaguar can eat big adult female turtles as well. Uh, real quick, Matt, I want to answer this because I didn't answer it, if you don't mind, Jessica. But one of the reasons that turtles are muted, this green and brown color, is for camouflage, to help them blend in with their background on the reefs or seagrasses and stuff, to help them blend in so that the sharks may not see them or other predators that may be out there looking for some lunch. Very cool. Thank you. Yes, thank you for grabbing that one. So we are actually at the end of our time, everybody, but thank you all for all of your wonderful questions. I do apologize. We were not able to get to all of them. Um, and that will bring an end to our session. So Carrie and Luciano, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing all about Florida's sea turtles and your research.